This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Nate Blayton. And this week we're very happy to have the two members of the bass clarinet duo Squonk, Jeff Anderley and Jonathan Russell. Guys, thanks for joining us this week. Thanks so much for having us. And uh, one's, we're in Europe and Alaska, too. So I think putting this together is kind of an amazing feat for us on Sound Notion. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> I think Skype is the official sponsor of this program today. Yeah, we absolutely <laughs> could not do any of the things that we do without it. So we thank them for giving us a, a cool product. But um, so you guys, you, tell us a little bit about how Squonk got started, um, because... I understand that you don't really live in the same place anymore, right? That you that you started Squonk from. Yeah, Squonk started um, in San Francisco. Um, I did a master's degree in composition at San Francisco Conservatory. I finished in two thousand and three, and then I was around teaching music theory there. And Jeff was doing his master's in clarinet performance, and I just heard him practicing in a practice room one day playing this um, piece by Evan Zaporin called Smindel Khmerto, a very difficult solo bass clarinet piece, which you generally don't expect to hear coming from a conservatory practice room. So I just wanted to see, um, see what was going on. And so you hung outside Jeff. the room for a long time, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I had heard about this sort of mysterious composer who also played bass clarinet that was sort of around the building somewhere. And so I was <laughs> keeping my eyes open. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, um, sorry. yeah, go ahead, John. So anyway, so, uh, so I introduced myself and then we decided to start playing together some, and then we did a recital together a few months later. Whereas mostly so we each did solo pieces and then we combined on a couple things. We had a friend, Ben Gribble, write a new piece for us. And we did the bass clarinet parts to um, New York Counterpoint, the Steve Reich piece. And, and we did this sort of phase version of the Bach cello suite. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was, it was really fun. We really liked playing together. And so then nice. basically a few months after that, Squonk was officially born. That was in so, 2005, I think. Yeah. So the first incarnation known as Squonk was pretty much, uh, I don't know, the mid-2000s. That's, you guys been around and successful for a while now, so it's incredible for a bass clarinet duo, certainly. Yeah, it's been really amazing to see, you know, how much is possible for just this bass clarinet duo, because when we started, it was just like it was really fun to play together, and it seemed like there was some sort of possibility of, you know, continuing to make music together, but... Um, it's just been really amazing to see all the stuff that's come uh, that's come of this of this duo partnership. So I, I, it's got to be. Uh, a, 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 I'm wondering why a bass clarinet duo was the thing that that was what, <laughs> as opposed to some larger group that included the two of you in some other capacity. It, it seems like that's really kind of going out on a, a repertoire limb. <laughs> when you started yeah. was that something that you discussed when you were putting the group together the first time well we didn't really discuss it because we were i mean like i wish we had had that kind of a conversation at the beginning because we were just kind of like well this is really fun why don't we you know let's make a band out of this duo thing <laughs> that we're doing um and yeah there definitely was zero pieces for bass clarinet duo when we started. So a lot of it um, came from our friend and John wrote and arranged a bunch of things. And since uh, I was still a student and John was recently not a student, we had a lot of composer friends who would write us stuff for free. Um, but, you know, a lot of the reason that we got together was just the instant we started playing together, it was just so easy to to play with each other. I mean, we, you know, our sort of rhythm and intonation and all these sort of things just kind of came together in a really fast way that um, I know for me, like, hadn't really happened with other chamber groups. So it seemed, you know, why would we add other elements to that when it works really well with just the two of us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I mean, the whole thing came about very organically. We definitely didn't kind of you know, we didn't sort of make a decision like, hmm, what, what would be a good kind of group to start? I know, how about a bass clarinet duo? It wasn't right. really that <laughs> thought process. We just started playing together and really enjoyed it, and it just kind of emerged from that. 
So where where have you then gone to find new repertoire since then? So I, I you said you started with your friends, and I assume you you've since branched out. I I, I would imagine that probably your closest friends have. have Said, you know, I've, I've really had enough of this writing for two bass clarinets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, our first CD was basically um, compositions and arrangements by myself and then a few of our friends. And then for our second CD, Black, um, we were able to get some grant money to fund some commissions. So we were able to commission composers like Mark Mellitz um, and Ken Thompson for composers, you know, that we knew personally but weren't really close friends with. And that certainly, um, you know, would it composers that we felt like we would have to pay them some commission money in order for them to write for us. Um, so that's kind of how that happened. Um, and now, you know, sometimes now we even have people kind of coming and soliciting us, asking to write for us now, which is nice. And we actually hear about the occasional bass clarinet duo that someone has already written for another group, which is, right. makes us pretty excited to hear that there's other sort of bass clarinet duo repertoire being created without us having to have our hands in it. And it's also cool that now other bass player duos are starting to take on some of our repertoire too. So it's just kind of like becoming an expanding genre of music, which is very exciting. Uh, what is the the reaction like when you contact a composer and say, hey, we'd like you to write a piece for two bass clarinets? Is that something that <laughs> they are usually very excited about? Or is that, uh, is that something that they, they have to stop and think, what do I do with, with well, that? Well, I think... Yeah, I think usually the initial response is like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. And they get really <laughs> sort of initially excited um, just because, you know, composers generally like bass clarinet because there's a lot you can do with it. Right. Um, but then it's interesting because it's two single voice instruments. Um, a lot of composers sort of get stuck maybe like a third of the way in with like, well, I can't really do harmony I can like barely do, you know, if I'm doing sort of interlocking uh, things, I only have two, you know, two voices, two monophonic voices to work with. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I mean, I'm, John's a composer, I'm not. And it's interesting for me to see how all the different composers handle that sort of challenge. And the thing that's interesting too is that now that we have kind of a body of repertoire built up, we send our CDs to composers and they have kind of that repertoire to respond to or think about also. Because yeah, yeah. one thing that's interesting is we find that most composers write for us somehow do seem to embody this sort of squawk sound or aesthetic, even though we never give them any specific guidelines about it. Well, how, how would you describe that that squawk sound or aesthetic? I mean, clearly there's, there's an idea that you have in mind. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, <laughs> I guess the, a good place to start would be like sort of people always ask us how we came up with the name squonk, um, which, you know, anyone that's made a, a band before knows that like naming the band is probably the hardest part of the entire process. Um, so we had like a brainstorming session where we wrote all these different words on a board, which was like squonk. No, well, squonk was the final one, but we wrote <laughs> squeak and honk and quack and sort of chirp and squawk. So they were all like on a monopolitic. <laughs> exactly. And then yeah. we just sort of like mush them all together and we're like, squonk, there we go. Um, so <laughs> I think it's sort of um, basically, you know, new classical music with onomatopoeia in it or something, you know, with... <laughs> Well, it, you know, it tends to be kind of rhythmically driving and intense, but also this kind of sort of playful or fun spirit to a lot of it also. Yeah. I like to say it's sort of like cute and ferocious at the same time. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> so would you say that you're actually being inundated with with people who want to write for this kind of ensemble now? I can imagine, you know, when you're first starting out, of course, your arrangements... Um, and your own compositions kind of dominated your rep. But, I mean, have you really noticed a dramatic increase with the other ensembles and with composers who are just now open to writing this new ensemble? Well, yeah, because going from, like, zero to five is, like, a 500% increase, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think inundated might be a strong term, but I think it definitely is increasing interest. Yeah. yeah, I mean, after, you know, five years of zero, you know, like, 
nothing out there. And now when we go, um, you know, I just met a composer the other day. It was like, oh, oh, I have a bass clarinet duo that I wrote, you know, and it's like it is becoming sort of a thing that people are trying, which I don't know if that's all due to us. And maybe it's just, you know, there are other sort of people talking about that. But Well, perhaps it is. I mean, um, I've seen, seen from your website you do a fair number of master classes as well. Um, mm-hmm. Do you often have composers visiting these master classes in addition to clarinetists? Yeah, we generally do. Um, we actually, when we visit universities, we like to do a clarinet and a composition master class both. Um, oh, so we'll have one for the clarinetists talking about bass clarinet and extended techniques and um, you know sound production and all that stuff. And then we'll go next door and talk to all the composition students about how to actually write all that stuff down and how to work with an ensemble. And um, so they're definitely, yeah, composers are um, aware of us when we go to universities. And we do have some pieces that have actually come about through, you know, assignments to write for us for this kind of workshop. That's Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And if you want Squonk at your university, (laughs) (laughs) we'll be there. (laughs) Go to squonk.com. And exactly. Fill out the form. <laughs> for all your masterclass needs. Right. We're, there. We're there for ad. you. <laughs> We've right, made right. A little ad. Normally, normally people pay big bucks for that, by the way. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Here, here on Sound Ocean TV, it's right. all big money. Right. I know, right? <laughs> um, so what? It, how how is it working together with you guys so far apart? How often do you get to rehearse nowadays? Well, so just to... So I was out in San Francisco until 2009. So we had a good, you know, four or five years at the beginning to where we were rehearsing at least once a week, sometimes more than that, to really kind of get all our core rep together. Um, so then I moved to the East Coast, and I was doing a PhD at Princeton, which I'm still doing. You know, I just moved to London, um, which makes things certainly makes things more complicated, but I do end up coming back to the Bay Area pretty frequently for various projects, including Squonk. So we rehearsed then, and, um, you know, we also are touring various places, and we'll throw in a few rehearsals when we tour. So um, I think it was really important for us to have that core period where we were in the same place to really develop our sound and, and learn our core repertoire. But now that we have that under our belt, you know, we're able to kind of learn stuff more quickly or sort of refresh stuff um, with, without the weekly practice time. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, the the sort of model for a lot of um, new music groups is to do a lot of touring and a lot of residencies. um, And, you know, a sort of even a, another contemporary music group might only get together a week before a concert anyway. So in a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's not that different from some of the other groups that I'm in that are all local. Um, And certainly whenever we go on tour that, you know, we'll meet, there beforehand and have some time together to to get things um into good shape for what we're doing mm-hmm. yeah we you have know, another go ahead sorry go ahead no absolutely go ahead i was just gonna say i mean another way that we're a little bit different from a lot of new music groups is that i think most new music groups kind of learn new material for each concert you know each concert is its own program and then they learn a new program for another concert um, you know, in a certain way, we're almost more like a rock band or something that we kind of have our greatest hits, which we come back to again and again. And what's nice about that is it feels like we really have this kind of core to our sound and our repertoire and just our relationship with some of these pieces, you know, that we've been playing for five or six years. It just, you know, you really develop a very sort of powerful and deep rapport with the music when you spend that much time with it. Yeah, I think that probably yeah. is, has a lot to do with the, the um, u- uniqueness of the, of the medium, Right there's not there's not right. a, a ton of rep there. We we have a lot of friends. Uh, the the three of us went to graduate school together at Michigan State, and we have some very good friends that are saxophonists, and they played in saxophone quartets in in graduate school, and they had that similar thing where there were you know this core repertoire that they just played a lot and got really amazingly good at, and they have the same geographic issues that you guys have. You know, there's there's no place in the world that needs four saxophone professors. Um, <laughs> so they all live in different places, and then they get together for these things. And so they, they I think uh, it's a it's a similar situation, um, though obviously you your your rep I think is probably even more specific to you. Um, do you have a lot of stuff that you adapt from other media? 
Not that much. We have, um, you know, I, ra- I arrange the Bach Toccata and Fugue in D minor organ piece for us. That's, wow. that's the main arrangement we do. In the early days, we did a lot more arrangements. We did some more, um, like, two-part Bach conventions. And we, we did the sixth movement of the Messiaen Quartet for the end of time <laughs> once or twice. Um, <laughs> some, of them, some of them worked better than others. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but is there anything else we've adapted, Jeff? I don't think so. Um, yeah. I keep telling John to do the Bach Chacon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> an arrangement for that. I would like to hear it, to be honest with you. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's an interesting <laughs> challenge that to, to put to put yourself to, but at the same time, I also think the way you're doing it, where you're commissioning completely new works, is also the the, the at least to me the, the, the really more interesting thing to do. Um, though there are certainly some circumstances like the Bach examples where you really can, um, you know, give it something new and not just kind of be this imitation of, of uh, another work, but bring something new to it, add to the, you know, collective world of Bach interpretations in a way, rather than kind of imitating this other Bach thing. Yeah, there's yeah. something about about that specific Bach piece which really felt like it was it fit with the Squonk aesthetic for some reason. Yeah, um, and that's what that's what inspired me to arrange it in the first place. But I don't think most classical pieces would have that effect. Right, it's almost like like setting a text. Like you're you're somehow giving more to a poem by by setting it, uh, and that's you know the the way you choose the the poem is the one that you can add to. And you, you yeah. choose Bach because you have a, a, a perspective to, to show on Bach other than just, you know, this is the way we can do it. Right. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, it sounds like you've done a lot of different kinds of things, and building this body of work is a wonderful thing. Is, have there, <laughs> can either of you think of, or do you have any other dream projects or like some particular thing with clarinet that you haven't put into a piece yet, John, or that you're hoping that somebody might <laughs> put into a piece if, to write for you or something? Or John has a dream. What's my dream? Really? Your bass clarinet uh, opera oh. dream. Oh, oh, that sounds yeah. awesome. Let's hear it. Let's hear this dream. <laughs> so I, actually, I did this very sort of short in, sort of instrumental opera, just like an eight-minute thing at, at Princeton a couple years ago, where it's been, it was three musicians who were also like the actors on stage interacting with each other and sort of told this little love triangle story. So anyway, I have this dream of making like a much larger scale version of that. And one aspect would be this herd of like 50 bass clarinet beasts. And I picture like the bass clarinet actually being their trunk and they'd be, you know, dressed as these beasts. It would just be this kind of, like, groaning choir of 50 bass clarinets. So is there a text? <laughs> no oh, text. Okay. All right. No text Interesting. at all. Well, that but sounds kind of yeah, that's, that's one dream. Well. I also have a much more realizable dream, perhaps, of, of starting, <laughs> like, a, like, a smaller, like, a bass clarinet non-it group. I wrote one piece for bass clarinet non-it, and I really liked that number of bass clarinets. So that's something I think about, but it's pretty hard to find... Um, that many bass clarinets in one place. Yeah, just um, just the but, instruments, not to mention people that know how to play them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in, reserved in for of, conferences. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of squonk, though, one sort of new thing that we've started is the CD that we're currently working on is is called Squonk Plus, and what we're doing for that is we're teaming up with um, six different groups uh, in San Francisco. Um, to do pieces that are written for sort of squawk plus something else. Um, and that's actually been really fun. Um, some of them were pieces that had already been written, um, and some of them were sort of written for this. Uh, but that's been really interesting to see, you know, what happens when you combine squawk plus a percussion duo or a string quartet or a p- piano forehand mm. group. That sounds really uh, interesting. Yeah, because we, yeah. we really want it to be actually we want it to be squonk plus, not just a chamber ensemble that happens to have two bass clarinets, but really like our group plus this other group, and kind of what happens with that collaboration. Now I, that's that's an interesting thing because you're bringing this this repertoire to a new group of people, and then maybe you know this two two bass clarinets and two percussionists or something. Maybe there are two percussionists that have a percussion duo somewhere else in the world, and then they go out and find two bass clarinetists the same way that you guys have gone out and found two percussionists. And yeah, kind of like bridging into this this other 
genre, this other repertoire, in a, in a, in a very uh, almost evangelistic way. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely <laughs> that's definitely part of part of what we want to do. Um, I mean, one thing that we started doing a few years ago is that whenever we do a concert, pretty much, we try and find another group to sort of share the bill with us. Um, just because it's so fun to have both, you know, the two different audiences there, and then often we'll combine at the end and do something together. Um, but it just, you know, music is such a collaborative thing that it's really great to have, you know, just more, you know, more musicians is usually a better thing. And that's actually where the idea for the for the project uh, came was because we ended up we had like two or three of these pieces ready that we wanted to record. So we thought, well, if we get a few more, then we can make a CD out of it. Um, but yeah, we definitely hope that you know a piano forehand uh, duo will hear our piece and try and find two bass clarinets to to perform it. So I notice on your site that you you have. Uh... Uh, things to buy sheet music store coming soon uh and that strikes me as another particularly evangelistic move like <laughs> see you can too play play the squonk the the home version of the squonk game exactly uh, squonk songbook. yeah yeah right <laughs> does that is that something you're still working on and what can you tell us a little bit about uh the the impetus behind that yeah, basically ahead, i yeah, I mean, it's been for, well. First of all, truth be told, it's been coming soon for quite a while now. But we're <laughs> we're gonna get to it one of these days. Um, but you know, basically, what happens is we'll get emails from bass clarinetists who are like who say, you know, I really liked that one piece on your album. Can I get the sheet music for it? And when that happens, we basically put them in touch with the composer, and they contact the composer and get the sheet music that way. But we thought it'd be nice if there's a centralized location where they could just go to our website and be able to access all the different squonk repertoire that way, instead of sort of having to go through this complicated process where they contact us and we put them in touch with the composer. Does that so happen that a lot, where people ask you about the rep? Yeah, it yeah. happens, happens pretty yeah, frequently. Pretty yeah. frequently, yeah. And there's a thing, I mean, there's a... Bass clarinet, you know, has like, sometimes gets all the funny stigma attached to it in like band programs at universities, for example, because it's sort of seen as like a lesser clarinet. So often when people become bass clarinet specialists, they get very like passionate about how awesome the bass clarinet is. And they get, when they hear about us, often they're very excited to see that like someone's taking the bass clarinet seriously. And then they're, you know, the sort of comments on our YouTube videos are often like, my band teacher said that bass clarinet is a bad instrument, but I'm going to show this to him and, you know, he'll have to treat me better or something. <laughs> um, so part of having the sheet music, making the sheet music easily available is because, you know, there, there seems to be just a need for, you know, yeah, preaching the bass clarinet gospel and showing that the bass clarinet is not just the sort of like secondary sort of, harmony instrument in a wind ensemble now i i, I wonder because that that's uh, obviously that's um something that a lot of people deal with i know it's something that like when i was in high school you know if you, if you couldn't if you were a clarinetist and you couldn't make the district band or the state band on the clarinet you would you would try on bass clarinet and if you really couldn't make it on bass clarinet then you would try <laughs> on alto clarinet um, <laughs> and that was kind of like the hierarchy, right? I don't, did, did, I'm sure you guys have have seen this this happen as well. And we were talking before the show started about clarinet conferences, um, and I, I when I see like instrument ensembles, that's one of the first things I think of. Is is in, this is this group is is for for people playing at their their like instrument conferences? You know, the saxophone mm -hmm. quartets they they do great at the saxophone conference and the and things like that. And and I I wonder if you ever are concerned, um, you know, you talked about bringing in your audience and then another group's audience. I wonder if you're ever concerned that you your audience is mostly other clarinet players and and it's kind of an insular thing. We have that same problem in, in new music that we we write music for and and talk to and about other composers, right? Is that something you yeah, think about? Well, we do because. I mean, first I'll say, you know, we are usually like a pretty big hit at the clarinet conferences. Sure. I mean, um, 
because, you know, it's just an unusual thing uh, to see two bass clarinets. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with being a hit in the clarinet world. You know what I mean? That's of course not. certainly not a bad thing. Um, but I think the thing that we try to do with Squonk is that we've always been interested in, in playing music that is like really fun to listen to for anybody, not just sort of a new music aficionado um, and sort of having that sort of like really visceral kind of exciting um, feeling when, when we're playing, um, you know, I think that the idea is to make it available for anyone, like, anyone would find something that they like about it. And then someone who's really into new music or really a like clarinet geek will just sort of get even more excited about hearing us. Hmm. And I have to say that as a composer, this connection to this clarinet community has been, you know, hugely beneficial for me. Um, uh, can you all hear me? Oh, oh we just oh, lost you. Yeah. I think you were just about to tell us oh. the benefits that you uh, have gotten. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you now. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I was just saying that as a composer, having this connection to the clarinet community is actually really beneficial because it's this very appreciative audience that you're able to, to reach and people who will buy your sheet music and, and stuff, you know, which is, is often, I've had much more success for example, selling sheet music in my bass clarinet compositions than of my more sort of standard in music ensemble type of stuff. So it can actually be a real benefit to tie into some kind of community like that yeah. beyond the new music community. But it's interesting because we kind of did it backwards in a way because our first audience was like the San Francisco Bay Area just music goers. I mean, those were for years and years. We just played around the Bay Area. We did a few like New York shows and that was just sort of general music audiences. And then it wasn't until I think our first time we went to the conference was like 2010 as Squonk. Um, and so, you know, I feel like we sort of built up the sort of mass market appeal first. And then we went to the, the conferences. Um, and I'm, I think that probably helped, um, you know, helped with how successful we've been at the conferences that were sort of appealing to, to more than just clarinetists. It's not something that only clarinetists will enjoy. This, this kind of addresses a, a question we actually got from the chat room. J.D. Cuevas uh, was asking how this affected your compositions, John. I, and it sounds like inside and outside of the group of, of having this duo. How yeah, has it affected been, your writing? It's had a huge effect, I would say. Um, you know, first of all, just my performing on bass clarinet has had a big effect on my compositions because, you know, composing through playing, it's just it's a very natural, very visceral way to write music. And so that's definitely had an impact. And somehow the kind of music I end up writing when I'm working with bass clarinets tends to be just this very kind of direct, very visceral, very fun, very groovy kind of music, which I wasn't really accessing before, um, before I was accessing it from a bass clarinet. And it's interesting also, now I find when I write, even for larger ensembles that aren't specifically squonk related, I still use some of the sort of squonky techniques sometimes. Nice. Um, like I wrote a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece for a large mixed chamber ensemble, which included, among other things, two bass clarinets. The two bass surprise, clarinets are always surprise. chugging along <laughs> there in parallel fifths and doing very squonky stuff, but it's in the context of this much larger chamber ensemble. Nice. Um, and it's also, and it's also just from more of a career perspective, it's been really helpful to me because it's, you know, it's it's sort of a lot of people notice my music first because of the bass clarinet stuff, but then maybe they'll come to my website and look at some of the other compositions too. Right. So it's also been very helpful for me from that perspective. Yeah, I have to imagine this must this must affect your uh, performance as well, or affecting your careers as performers, having the squonk duo and being clarinetists outside of that as well. Is that <laughs> Yeah. yeah, helping. I mean, yeah. Or... <laughs> oh, def no, it definitely helps. I mean, um, right. you know, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, because John and I, you know, really sort of push each other to be better clarinetists all the time when we're together, which is really great. I mean, it's really nice to have that sort of like really well meaning sort of, it's not even like competition. It's just that like when I'm playing with John, like I want to just, play really well so that he's, you know, having a good time. And I think it's, you know, <laughs> that goes both ways. Yeah. Um, 
and then yeah you know just having it's really nice as a as a musician when you play in a lot of different groups it's nice having sort of like a couple of sort of focal points where you're like, Oh, Oh, you're the squat guy. Okay. Like, Oh, I've heard of that. You know, cause <laughs> that's not that often that, you know, if you play in different contemporary music groups or something, people often haven't heard of them, but squonk sort of has a little more name recognition than some of the other stuff I do. It's good branding. <laughs> as well, <I> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I think the name has a lot to do with it. It's very, very snappy name, um, and we should talk about the spelling too. Yeah, hey. how did how did that come about? Because I the, the really w- I kept having to check it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I, I got it now, but I I wanted to make sure that I was getting it right before. So how did right. that happen? How did that come about? Well, was it's, that a fight? It was no, no. It was that was no. part of the same brainstorming session with all the other words. So we sort of. Um, you know, S Q U O N K squonk is you know that's a pretty good word, but S Q W O N K. I mean, that's just fantastic. It's got all the like jaggedy lines, and <laughs> it sort of just like looked a lot better when we wrote it out. It's a complete um, branding issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and and it's 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 probably less likely to be taken on the internet. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, definitely. Right. Yeah. Because squonk is, you know, and well, what's interesting is we learned later that a squonk with a U is actually a thing that exists already and not just in really? a, a noise sense. Yeah. So it's, it's squonk is in uh, like Appalachian folklore. It's a, a monster, like a small monster that is so ugly that if it ever sees a reflection of itself, it starts crying and it cries so hard that it dissolves into nothing and disappears completely. And how come there wow. is no character piece about this creature that I don't know? Been yeah, I think for there's like duo? there are a couple. There's like a there's like a Neil Young song or something that mentioned. There's like a couple like you know rock songs that mention the squonk um because the story is that like a guy captures one and puts it in a bag but then by the time he gets back to town it's sort of cried itself um into oblivion oh man oh, well that's... let's not hope that's a direction that squonk you're <laughs> no, you need a you need a piece for squonk about squonk about with a w squonk. about squonk with a u I, well, get on it. I'm, get on it. I'm, you guys are all composers. Yeah, I'll get, <laughs> yeah, right? get, right, get, I'll get right back to you, actually. <laughs> Hold on, yeah. <laughs> um, g- give me a minute. Uh, I think, actually, we're going to move on to our stories. But if, if, you're, if you're watching and listening to this, definitely stick around. We're going to play an excerpt of a, a video of a performance by these guys uh, at the end of the show. Um and I think I want to see what the deal is with, with Jonathan real quick. I would think we may have just lost him. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Wah, wah. Wah, oh. Wah. Uh-oh. It's time. Let's see if we can get him back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best. See, I don't even like to edit the show if this happens, just because I like the. I usually so. leave at least part of it in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got to leave some of that. <laughs> this is an original composition by Dave McDonald as well. The music you're hearing. <laughs> Contrafact of Joe so and Panina. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Sorry about that. No problem. Right. Get that video on. Getting there. Hey, this is what we can hear you. Aren't we just need your video. Yes. There it is. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I don't quite have it yet. Can you see me now? No. Here oh, you now I, I do. Yeah. All right. Now All I got right. you. And thus ends the uh, technical difficulties card. We have more technical difficulties. Now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Instead it's a cat in a RPs. shark suit riding a Roomba chasing a duckling. It's basically, there's no reason we shouldn't try to have technical difficulties every week. Well, here's the thing. If there was going to be a music video to go with like any squonk piece, 
that would be the video that would go <laughs> with pretty much like any piece that we play. Yeah, you should do that. Yeah. You should you should grab the video and just play right. it in the background behind for you like for like five different pieces. That yeah that, yeah. <laughs> that, oh man, it should just be all like a whole playlist of of cat videos like that. No no right. no audio, just just the video, and then you stand in front of it and play squonk music. <laughs> it would be a little Dada, and I think it'd yeah. be pretty cool. Um, so you can listen to Squonk at the end of the show today, but uh, if you can't wait to hear any new music, you could go to Pandora right now and and listen to to, to just about anything. And if you do that, you should check out some new uh, channels that they have. One of the problems that we in classical music have had for uh, since we started trying to distribute music on the internet is that it doesn't really work the same way as popular music. Um, and we complain about this all the time. We've talked on the show a bunch of times before about the problems with Pandora and Spotify and iTunes and Amazon, for that matter, not giving us the, the right metadata uh, and telling us who the composer is and the performer is. And it's, 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 it's a mess. There's, there's just more, more data that we want than these systems are set up to give because they're set up for you know telling you the, the name of the song and the band that's playing it, and that's all you need to know. Um, so Pandora is trying to solve this. We, we talked a month ago or so about uh, Rhapsody starting to offer or transitioning to offering more information, a little bit more detailed uh, metadata for their songs. But Pandora is uh, now going to be... Have, they're, they're having some new Pandora radio stations. And notably, they will have a station that plays whole works instead of just individual quote unquote songs. Whereas those songs are, I, if you're listening, you're missing my air quotes. Uh, <laughs> but the songs are, you know, movements of concerti and symphonies and sonatas and things that don't make sense to be broken up or really could be like something that's ataka and stops in the middle of a thing you know it could be like an opera aria or something where there's not even like a break and it just or like sh- switches to, to the next to, thing trying to listen to the right of spring or something where like some of the movements right. are like a minute long yeah right yeah well that's why there's so many recordings of right of spring that have like no tracking or two tracks or something and they're each like 20 minutes long instead of those like 30 seconds a minute and a half thing that would be really frustrating to me actually so is this new station exclusively going to play full works or that's are the, they also keeping the, the option of playing so i think this is not uh, a change to an existing station but additional stations that they're adding oh okay if i if i understand this correctly that um, means there will be less works on the station. There will be fewer works on the station, perhaps. Fewer, fewer. <laughs> I mean... <Sorry. laughs> it's not lesser it's works. Not, <laughs> it, 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 is, uh, it is countable. Is, do you guys... Does anybody... I should say, does anybody actually use Pandora to listen to music? I do not, actually. I haven't used it to listen to classical music, but... I've, yeah. I've got no, a salsa station, I've got a book station, I've got different <laughs> things like that. All right. Yeah. I've used I it very occasionally, but... Yeah, I I mostly use uh, Spotify and my own personal library because I maybe I'm just a control freak about music listening, but I would like to pick the music that I'm listening to and not have it picked for me. There are some times when I don't really care, and but those are times when I'm not really listening very closely, and so I might as well put my own library on shuffle for all that I'm going to listen to it. Right? Am I, is, that, yeah. is that totally weird? Or no, I that's. I feel similarly. I, I'd much rather, I mean, I don't bizarre. I mean, I feel like I play so much music during the day that I don't actually listen to that much music when I get home. So if I am going to listen to music, I want to have like total control over what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, I, do I, think I don't Pandora listen can be, I do think Pandora can be good as sort of a research tool, you know, might yeah. lead you to mm-hmm. stuff that you didn't know about before. Yeah, and that's exactly be, what I use it for. Is like, yeah, looking for new electronic music that I haven't heard before or something. I'm just like looking for a specific kind of texture, but not, yeah, not really knowing what exactly. Yeah, and if I'm in the like, if I'm looking for something specific, like like Jeff, I imagine you might be after a long day of playing stuff. But yeah, then sure. And, and, and I don't want to I don't want to dump on this new 
thing that they have because it's actually a pretty great thing and it's moving in the direction of you know the the ideal classical music streaming service where it treats it as a separate thing from popular music or at least has it has unique needs i mean it doesn't it's, it's not a different thing it's still music but yeah, just recognizing the difference in format exactly yeah, yeah. exactly it makes yeah. a I mean, yeah, actually, classical radio station which right is right complete pieces mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this uh, actually would certainly make me sign up for Pandora, like much more likely to sign up for Pandora, knowing that there's a thing that plays whole pieces, because why would I like get a radio station that's just going to play kind of easy listening, like slow movements from right. unknown Baroque composers or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you'd get a lot of people listening to something like that, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I <laughs> unfortunately, um, but, you know. I, it's it's cool that they're trying new things, and I would love to see Spotify include some of this stuff and Google Play Music that I have recently started using do some more of this stuff. Uh, we'll we'll keep our eye out. Uh, another cool new web service. This is a company that just started just launched their their service called Score Street. Um, there's a piece about it in uh, New Music Box this week, but they are kind of a self-publishing service and they will let composers sign up and upload their scores. They have uh, some fees that they charge for uh, editing. If you want them to do any, I guess, uh, engraving or typesetting or anything like that for your scores. And they allow people to then come, performers can come and search their database of music and buy uh, printed to order copies or PDF downloads of the scores, and they will deal with the licensing issues. So they administer the they don't you don't give them the copyright, and as you might in a in, in other kinds of publishing deals, but they administer the copyright. So they'll do the licensing and and all that kind of stuff for you if somebody wants to license your music, and they um, uh, do this all while giving you a hundred percent net of the net that they get from those those fees so they'll i mean they'll take out their expenses but you get the thing the the charge is 30 dollars a month to have the membership and have your stuff up um Hmm. does that sound like anything any of you guys would use i might i definitely would look into it yeah um i mean obviously it only makes sense if you're selling more than 30 dollars worth of stuff a month. right right Um, now, I, I, I will say that I've looked at some of the scores that are there. Um, there are a couple of, uh, of composers whose names you might recognize. Probably the biggest name composer they have on there is Esapekka Salonen, and he's only got two works. Um, but there are some other composers on there as well, notably Frank Oteri of New Music Box um, has, has probably... 10 or so scores on there most of the prices for the scores that i that i saw were 10 to 20 dollars for the the print to order copy and uh, five to ten dollars for the pdf so not huge uh huge prices and from what i could tell it looked like they are setting the prices on these that's what i heard which which, seems which a is funny. a little weird yeah yeah, yeah. So, hmm. so so there is no uh, sorry um is there a s- a sale versus rental model? They this? do have rentals. They do have rentals. That's a good question. They do have rentals, and they do uh, manage the uh, performance royalties for grand rights. They do, okay. they do the grand rights stuff for you. They do the rental stuff for you. Um, they, In fact, it says in here, and this might even almost be uh, something that makes it worth it, they, they handle registering the works with, with your performance rights organization um which at least for bmi is a pain because you can't there's not a web form still in 2013 there's not a web form which in seriously bmi 2013 not a web form you fill out a pdf and email it to them (laughs) i know it's kind of annoying to fill out but but they have it well it's at least they have it are you bmi dave yes yes all right Okay. <laughs> okay. If you had um, figured that out, I have a question. If you if you use their service, 
does it have to be exclusive? Can you still sell stuff through your website if you want to? That is that is something that they're avenues? they're very clear about. You can use you can sell your own stuff. You can even have other services sell your stuff. Oh, the okay. only thing that they require uh, is that they are the exclusive license negotiator for like grand rights and sync rights and stuff like that. Huh. Um, but well, then I I don't understand. Composers who offer their music through Score Street pay a monthly subscription fee, but retain full ownership. Of Correct. all their materials. Right. Correct. And you can end your thing with them at any time. You can say, um, any any month you can say, cut me off at the end of this payment period, and then you get it, all of that stuff back. So that's one thing. Um, I really, I mean, most of the time, if somebody wants, if somebody sends me an email and says, hey, can I have a pdf or, your, or can I, how do i get a copy of this score i will most of the time just send them a pdf and say if you perform it either send me the program to report or make sure that it gets reported by who's ever presenting the program mm -hmm. uh and then i'll get probably more money from that performance than i would for what i could reasonably charge them for a pdf mm -hmm. right i mean especially if they're going to do it more than once I'm I'm happy to if anybody's watching this and you want to score, send me an email. I'll send you a PDF. It'll be great. Are you uh, as a composer, Dave? Are you uh, oh, and um, Jeff and Jonathan too and Nate? Are you are you all okay with um, sending people PDFs and having them just keep them? No, I don't I've know. Never I've, said no well, before. Yeah. I I, I would I wouldn't imagine you would, but I mean, it's like, are you are you totally okay with just having a Someone having a digital copy. You know, that's, that's something that I couldn't figure out. I have something I looked for on Score Street, um, which has a perfectly functional web page. It's not like beautiful yet, but I hope they'll get there. Um, they really need a new logo. I love your service. Your service is a great idea, guys, but the logo, let's find a designer. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing that I that's couldn't bad. figure out was how the PDF thing worked. It didn't seem. As far as I could tell, they didn't mention anything about them being protected in any way, um, okay. which is fine with me because I I think that that kind of those protections usually just are a pain in the butt to the people that are trying to use your thing legally, the way that you intended for them to use it, and I I understand. so easy to get around. I mean, and it's so you exactly just print it and make a PDF. Like. Any any yeah anybody that wants to you know get around your whatever protection you have on there can and the people that don't that aren't sophisticated enough to know how are the ones that are hurt that are trying to use it normally um so i don't know when i send people pdfs i say just you know don't like put it on your web page or something like I, and i think they usually say that that's okay the when i buy a lot of ebooks from independent publishers and when one of the more uh, interesting solutions that I've seen to this is that every page has a little thing at the bottom that says this PDF was prepared for and then it's got your name and your email address. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like if you were I, to post it, everybody would know that you were the, the, the douchebag that, that ruined it for everybody. Yeah. I, I, I remember talking to a composer. I can't remember who it was who said they do something similar. They have like a personalized watermark on their PDFs. That's hmm. interesting. I don't. I don't know how they do it, but um, yeah, it seems like you'd have to do that idea. programmatically, right? You can't. You can't like go in and put it right. in there on every page, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So it's, anyway, it's an interesting service. We'll see how it how it shakes out. It seems like it's the kind of thing that is only going to be useful if it gets enough composers to want for for performers to be confident that they're going to find something that they want when they go there. Build up um, the library. Yeah. And though yeah. I will say that the PDFs are something that if the right people and the right pieces are on it, that I just as a composer for my own study would be interested in PDFs of, of a lot of pieces um, that, right. that might potentially find their way onto a service like this. You know, we've talked before about composers selling uh, their, their scores in general. So many composers make it really hard to just buy a copy of the score. Uh, you know, you can go rent it if you're going to perform it, but if you just want to have it to like write in and study, that's really frustrating to, to find. And we we talked to to Jen Higdon last year, and she sells study scores, like small scores of of her stuff from her site, 
uh, and I, I, I wish more composers would do that. I say that, but I don't do that. So, yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> point is, send me an email. I'll send you a PDF. <laughs> if 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 I didn't make that clear before. Um, speaking of Frank J. O. Terry. He had a great piece this week about uh, uh, a a public sing that he took part in this week um, of Carmina Burana, and first of all, that sounds really interesting. I think it was he said it was at Symphony Space, and they had you know a professional orchestra there, and they had professionals sing singing the solo roles. But there's this you know there's no you know division between the audience and the performers in this kind of thing. Everybody shows up, and they sing their Carmina Burana score and uh first of all this sounds awesome and I wish that I could have gone to something like that uh but second of all uh he he wonders if there is a place for something like that in new music if there is a a, a place for community amateur music making in new music and I'm wondering if that's something any of you have ever thought about or explored you know, I think it's tricky because, you know, this is done with the Messiah all the time, too. Right, exactly. Sing it yourself, Messiahs. But I think it's tricky because the thing about the Messiah and Carmina Burana is they're such widely known pieces that right. people just kind of have them in their ears. And it's, I mean, it's kind of impossible to do that with a brand new piece, you know. Uh, you'd, have, you'd have everybody, you know, sight reading it completely without even knowing what it sounds like. So I don't know. I think it would be a pretty difficult thing to do. Yeah, and, well, and Frank points... Go ahead. Well, I think there's a... I mean, I've definitely... S- played in or seen some um, some more like performance art type pieces that have mm. a musical component that I think um, one was like there's a group of people walking in a circle and uh, the composer would give like hum a pitch for each of the people as they go by mm. and so like this kind of really cool chord gets built up that changes um, but one of my friends up here in Alaska actually just did a sort of public performance of uh, in C that was like, wow. it was a small new music group as the core musicians. And they were sharing the bill with a, like a pretty traditional rock band. Um, and then everyone got together plus anyone in the audience who had an instrument could bring their instrument and join in and play along. And, you know, not everybody read music. Um, so it wasn't like the traditional, in C with exactly those 50 cells or whatever, but people just kind of either copied the cells that they heard or just kind of played whatever they want. And she said it was, you know, like one of the coolest things she's ever done. So that's cool. I think there yeah, are some cool. pieces that would lend themselves to that yeah. well. What I, and I think, uh, you know, John, you were saying that it's hard for stuff that people don't know, but I think really even Karina Burana is really on the edge of that. And not not uh-huh. just is, is it that people don't know a lot past the first 30 seconds of of (laughs) the first movement, but also that it's hard. Yeah. I mean, the Messiah is kind of hard, but it's, it's also been around long enough that the, the vocal techniques to perform the Messiah are the sorts of things that people that sing have grown up learning how to do. And that's a little bit less the case with, with Orf, I think. And Frank even points out that there there's a lot there are a lot of places in Orf where it was the tenor part was too high and, and and the bass part was too low and he was kind of like jumping back and forth between them all the time and I think that's probably a challenge for for new music as well and uh, some a, a challenge that in C uh, Jeff you pointed out is uniquely suited to deal with um, because it's relatively approachable. Uh, technically and right. I, and I I wonder if that's an interesting challenge if we've we've talked to composers on the show before who really enjoy the challenge of writing for um student musicians and I and I and I think that this is an, another step past that but I, I I wonder if there's if that challenge is worth overcoming for the outreach value of doing something like this if you can I mean, get I'd love somebody to see... hooked yeah, on sorry, I'd... yeah go for it Oh, no, I'd, I'd love to see a piece that's like a sort of uh, concerto for a small ensemble with like the audience participation as the orchestra or something, whether it's, you know, voices or sort of clapping, different kind of percussion stuff or amateur musicians or something. So, you know, a small duo to quintet would prepare, you know, the solo voice and then 
whoever happens to be in the audience would be the accompaniment to it or something. I think that would be pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, it sounds, and I don't know if somebody, if somebody wants to do something like that, I think electronics lend themselves to this a lot because it's not an instrument that somebody has to have some facility on. You can have some kind of participatory thing that you can do on your phone or with some kind of gizmo that they can hand you at the door or something. Uh, yeah. we saw, There's that unsilent night thing, right? Yeah, we've right. performed that a few times, actually. We, yeah. When, yeah, that's when, a, when yeah, we were radios. all in school, we used to do that every year. It was an annual uh, event through through East Lansing. I don't know if anybody's still doing that. But yeah, we, but and, and that's something that you know, know, all you need is a boombox. So yeah? What were you saying? I just think I did that in San Francisco once. It was really fun. I think it happens every year in San Francisco it. still. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we just saw a, a piece, uh, Le Norman Lebrecht had a piece on his blog this week about uh, a, a work that was written in, in the form of like a video game for a cellist <laughs> and four people playing some kind of game controller. And yeah. uh, like the, the, the cellist had a microphone and could make the, the thing on the game that they were controlling do different things depending on what sort of music he would play. Um, so something like that, there's just these people playing a video game and are impacting the sound, which I think is, a, is an interesting thing and, and another way to include relatively directly um, the audience in, in the, the actual performance. Mm -hmm. um, so something else to consider. Hopefully there will be grants to support these things for a, a little while longer. Uh, though I make no promises, the uh, Republicans on the House subcommittee for the something in the interior, the interior and something, the, the, the committee that controls the, the budget for the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, a House put, Appropriations Committee. Well, there's a, it's a subcommittee of the Appropriations oh, Committee oh, okay. that does the interior and something else. The but anyway, their proposal was it, it, the the house gop released their 2014 budget proposal and uh spoiler alert they would like to give less money to the national endowment for the arts uh in in fact they would like to give about half as much money to the national endowment for the arts and the national endowment for the humanities uh i don't have a lot to add to that but uh if that sounds like something you would like to contact your representative about um Go for it. I would. I would never discourage you from doing that. It's going to start to be a thing this fall uh, when the budgets actually start to uh, get argued about in more detail. Uh, but for now, the proposal has been made, and uh, you know, start budgeting. is what I'm saying. And so, and how much? How much will that save the average taxpayer? You know? Oh, I'm <laughs> guessing less than they can even measure through any current unit of currency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the NEA budget already is just such small potatoes, so it's, already, it's grabbing like a lot of money that really is needed from a lot of ensembles and institutions that require grants from them. Yeah, though we've, we've talked about people before, even in the arts community, that say, you know what, let's just bail on it because it's, it's not enough money to really be worth fighting over. Um, so it's, it is, not, it's, it's not a uni I'm just saying that it's not a universally... Uh, uh, e even among the arts community, it's not universal, universally approved of. Yeah. So. Well, I it's because it, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, I do think that one of the strengths of the way of arts funding works in our country is that it, it is so diffuse. There's so many private foundations right. and things involved, and I think in a way that that's a better model than you know some of the European models where it's the government funding everything. Because then, if then if there are cuts, then it's like there's nowhere else to turn. Right. And, and it's something that has been happening for a long enough time that we've started to find ways to deal with it. Right. Um, we've talked before on the show uh, about Perry Chen, one of the co-founders of Kickstarter, keeps going around and saying how much money Kickstarter gives creative uh, projects more than the National Endowment gives to creative projects. That I think Kickstarter gave something like 600 million something to, to creative projects. Now, not well, all of those are the sorts of things. Kickstarter didn't give any of that money, really. I mean... Sure. Well, I, you're right. Well, you're absolutely I mean, right. For other people to give them. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, well, we could also say that NEA doesn't give the money. Taxpayers give the money. But they still sure. 
enable it, right? Sure. And 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 a lot of the things that Kickstarter funds are, you know, watches and pens and books and and not not all of the sorts of things that the NEA would fund, but a lot of it is. Um, so there's that too. Speaking of of base clarinets and Kickstarter, you should all go fund Michael Lowenstern's project. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I I just thought of that. Um, I, mean, I certainly feel like I'm, I think it's much more likely I'll get funding from Kickstarter than the NEA anytime soon. Well, the NEA you know? doesn't I mean, do any The NEA has very little anyway. impact on what I've ever done. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 You get a lot of those sub grants, though. Maybe somebody that you've gotten a grant yeah, from has gotten that true. money from the NEA because the NEA doesn't do those individual grants anymore. So let's yeah. move on. Speaking again of bass clarinet music. Uh, we're going to play our pick of the week this week. Sam is not here to sh- do his pick of the week shout. Um, but our pick of the week is uh, from our, our guests, Squonk. Uh, it's Black by Mark Mellitz, which actually has, has been a pick of the week before. We, we, we showed a video of uh, a couple of Barry saxophone players playing, playing Black earlier. Uh, do you guys want to say anything to, to set this piece up? I don't think it needs a setup, really. Yeah. We can talk about it after, yeah. All right. Well, here it is then. This is uh, our, our guests, Jeff and John Squonk, playing uh, Black by Mark Mellitz. Our guests, uh, Jeff and John Squonk, performing Mark Mellitz's "Black." So, uh, Jeff, you said you sounded like you had something you 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 wanted to say, but you wanted to wait until afterwards. Oh, not really. No? Just you know, that's just one of our favorite uh, favorite pieces to play, and uh, it feels so you know, good. It, it does yeah. feel good, <laughs> and um, you know, I don't know if it's the partially the room or the mics but that is such a full bodied sound with huge projection that comes out and i'm willing to bet a lot of it is due to you guys <laughs> maybe i mean like that it just sound, too, but it yeah. sounds so it sounds very huge and i and i like the sound yeah i mean it's yeah. very satisfying to play also it's just super i yeah, mean it's just I mean, it, low it sounds, and loud yeah and that, like, that register yeah. just lends itself so well Feels yeah. like you're you really using the the entirety of the bass clarinet when well, you're when you're kind doing of. That. The I mean, full in a way, we're really the thing. well. We're only really using like the bottom octave, actually. <laughs> right. You know, it's interesting because a lot of other composers have us going sort of into these stratospheric, um, you know, range because the bass clarinet can play really high right. and do all these, you know, play long notes, for example, which you know Mark doesn't really use any. He just uses like one tiny little idea. Um, for it but it's yeah it's so so great and it's great that the the piece has really taken off too i mean he's arranged it for so many different combinations and it's performed i mean i probably hundreds of times now didn't he say he's like i think think he's sold like 500 copies of it or something that's that's mark's calling card (laughs) (laughs) speaking of which i mean he's it's interesting he's the composer he's very adamant about not making pdfs of any of his stuff available it's all um 
hard, it's all hard copies because he doesn't want it getting out there. Well, he's. I think he's. He's. It's not hurting him. I yeah, think it's no, fair I, to say. I think, yeah, there's definitely. You know, there's enough demand for his stuff that. And and if you search right for another thing, you know, I I just pulled that from YouTube. But if you search for Mark Mellet's Black on YouTube, there's like a hundred performances yeah. you could pick from. Yeah. Man. Right, I mean, I a lot, a lot of bass clarinets, a lot of saxophones. It's all there. Um, so yeah, it's this very, very cool thing, and I, it's 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 one of those pieces that I think works really well uh, for outreach because it's so groovy, um, and it's it's really. I mean, we, it was starting to like ease up as as I, I faded out the the excerpt there at the end, but up until then, it's like chugging along with no breaks. Um, and, and if, and if it weren't two people, there'd be a lot of circular breathing going on. Um, and I would <laughs> imagine there, there might, there might even be a fair amount still, um, yeah. but it, it's, There's it's a little pretty bit, relentless. Yeah. yeah. And I mean the, you know, it eases up for about, you know, 20 seconds and then it gets super intense again. So it's not really, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, it's kind of, you just kind of go for the whole, for the whole thing. You don't really get to have much time to think about what's happening. <laughs> There's some um, there's some great choreography to it on YouTube too, which you should try to look for at some point. All right. Oh yeah. 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 We we yeah. worked with uh, Janice Garrett and Charlie Moulton, who are these two choreographers in San Francisco, and they choreographed the whole oh, the whole sequence to black. It's, it's really awesome. With, with your performance. Nice. Yeah, we played it live for the show. Yeah. Have you done a lot of that kind of collaboration before? We've done two shows with these specific choreographers. Um, no, it, it's not just squonk. There are other musicians involved too, but both of the shows use some squonk repertoire. It's really fun. That sounds pretty great. Yeah, I, I wonder if Mark's getting that big grand rights money now. <laughs> now that he's got ballets. We, <laughs> we worked it out with him. <laughs> nice. Well, do um, you guys have any anything else you want to ask about squonk, about this piece? Is there any, any other questions from chat? I don't see any. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, yeah, thank you. This has been really fun. Yeah, keep in touch. If you got a big CD coming out, another big project coming out, be sure to let us know. We'd be happy to to, to have you back to to plug it sometime. You have any anything coming up immediately you want to plug before we go? Well, this uh, CD project, this Squamp Plus CD project, um, you'll be seeing a Kickstarter about it in the next month or two. So oh, I guess uh, keep your eyes peeled for that, Excellent. and we're going to have some some pretty fun. Uh, rewards as part of that so Excellent. stay tuned i'm a fan of kickstarting so <laughs> yeah i will, I will yeah. definitely be back or be a back so if the nea wants to step in we're happy to right right yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll step aside and let the nea do it yeah <laughs> right they, i'm sure they would love like a squonk sticker or something for backing your project <laughs> That's what, so that should be a thing. The NEA should go on Kickstarter and use like NEA funds to kickstart things. Yeah, that's see how I just invented a thing. I just invented a thing. Or they could raise their budget on Kickstarter if the pro could it. <laughs> Kickstart the mind. federal government. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we just broke Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> thank you to everyone who is joining us uh, streaming the show live we really appreciate it if you would like to watch this show uh, in the future we do this show every Sunday uh, usually at 11 a.m. Eastern Time um, so tune in 11 a.m. Eastern Time and you can do your own calculations for your for your local time zone I would tell you what the universal time code thing is but I don't really understand what that works so uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all. We also appreciate everyone who's watching or listening to the recording. You should absolutely check these guys out at squonk.com. That's S Q W O N K dot com. Uh, and, and buy their stuff and, and follow their, their calendar and go to their shows. Uh, cause they're, they're, they're really a lot of fun and, uh, you, they, they deserve your, your Kickstarter dollars. Um, if you'd like to read about any of the stories that we talked about on the show, or if you have any comments about the bass clarinet repertoire or anything like that, we'd love to continue this conversation with you after the fact. You can uh, like us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and comment in all those places that you do those things. You can also find links to the stories that we talked about at soundnotion.tv slash sn. We'll have links to these guys, links to uh, all these stories in our show notes. Um you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store. If you'd like to support us, you can find those links on our site, soundnotion.tv slash sn as well. 
Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week.